Hello everyone in chemical reactor design. This lecture will be ded dedicated for some thermodynamics review, especially those related to equilibrium. Okay, so let's talk about reversible reactions. And before we proceed, let's review some thermodynamics since we will be dealing a lot with reversible equilibrium reactions. For the reaction, two moles of A or two molecules of A gives you one molecule of B. This is a reaction. And you can write Kc for this reaction. Again, we're talking about concentration equilibrium constant is written for the above reaction as the concentration of B at equilibrium divided by concentration of A at equilibrium raised to the power 2. And how do we calculate delta H reaction? For the above reaction, it's simply the standard delta H formation for B minus 2 times the standard delta H formation for A. And of course, the units in this case for such calculation would be only joule and that's what Smith & Van's textbook used or you can say the quantity calculated is joule per two moles of A reacted or you can say joule per mole of A produced okay let's write the same reaction exactly the same chemical reaction but write in different stoichiometry which is writing in a different stoichiometry. So we divide the above equation by 2. And now that stoichiometry is written as 1 molecule of A produces half molecule of B. In this case, it's better to say 1 mole of A produces half mole of B because you cannot produce half molecule. Um, okay. So let's look at this reaction and if we want to write Kc for this reaction that Kc expression would be concentration of B at equilibrium to the power point 5 divided by concentration of A at equilibrium and if we want to calculate the standard delta H reaction for this reaction you will say it's 0.5 times standard delta H formation of B minus the standard delta H formation for A and again the unit could be joule or simply you can say joule per mole of a reacted okay so since we're talking about the same reactions same reactions here the species a is same as species a here and the species b is same as species b here so we can notice that kc1 kc1 simply equals Kc2, this is Kc2, raised to the power 2. And the delta H reaction here, for reaction as written in this stoichiometry, equals 2 times the delta H reaction written for this stoichiometry. Okay, so do you see the relationship? Do you see how the change in the stoichiometry of the equation changes? the values of Kc and the values of delta H reaction. So therefore we say for thermodynamics calculation reactions are considered as written. Okay. So let's look at this reversible reaction. We have two moles of benzene reacts to give you one mole of diphenyl and one mole of Hydrogen. Symbolically, we can write the above equation as 2B gives you an irreversible reaction, D plus H2. And of course, the rate constant for the forward reaction is defined as Kb. The rate constant for the reverse reaction, again with respect to B, is written as K minus B. Okay, so this discussion we shall consider this gas phase reaction to be elementary and reverse طيب 
for this reaction, for this reaction as written this way, we can define Kc to be concentration of D at equilibrium times concentration of hydrogen at equilibrium divided by concentration of B, the benzene, at equilibrium raised to the power 2. And this is known as concentration equilibrium constant, Kc, which you work with in chemistry a lot. However, however, the more fundamental, the more fundamental parameter uh, representing equilibrium is known as equilibrium constant, K capital, equilibrium constant. So what is it? Where it's coming from? Okay, let's go back to thermodynamics 2 and probably you remember the criterion of chemical reaction equilibria. The criterion of chemical reaction equilibria. We say the summation of all the chemical potential equals to zero at equilibrium. That means summation of mu i times mu i equals to zero, where mu i is mu i, this guy, is known as chemical potential for species i. And mu, of course, you know it already. Mu is the stoichiometric number. So what does that mean? What does a chemical potential mean? Uh, the word potential means the ability to do something. For example, if someone has the potential to run, then if you let him go, he would run, right? If you have someone has potential to become a great scientist, if you prepare for him a good environment, he will study and experiment and be a good scientist because he has the potential to be a good scientist. Same thing with uh, gravitational potential. If you place a body under or inside a gravitational field, it will it will have the potential to do something. If you leave that body, it will fall down. For example, toward the center of gravity, uh, you have the electromotive force voltage V is also kind of a potential because. Uh, if you have a battery, it has a potential of 9 volt. So if you connect an external circuit to that battery, there is a potential, great potential for electrons to move through the external circuit. The same thing with electromagnetic force and electromagnetic field. If you leave a charged particle in electromagnetic magnetic field, it will, it will have a potential to move toward the opposite charge of course okay so i'm sure now you have a good hang of the word potential so let's go back to chemical potential chemicals also have potential to either change their nature to other species okay so b has a chemical potential to be converted to dnh and dnh each of these guys have chemical potential to be converted to B. Of course, not to mention that they also have chemical potential to change phases, right? If you have boiling water at 100 degrees C, one atmosphere, you can evaluate its chemical potential to go from the liquid phase to the uh, vapor phase and so on, even if it wasn't in a, in a boiling point. Okay, so at equilibrium, the chemical potential from the side pushing the guys from the side to the side equals the chemical potential of these two guys for converting them from this these chemicals to these chemicals. So obviously at equilibrium the both chemical potentials from both directions are the same, therefore that means no one would win and equilibrium is reached. Okay, from this criterion, the following equation is derived. Okay, so it's the pi i, which is the multiplication of these terms for, for species i raised to the power nu i, equals exponent of minus standard delta g reaction at a given temperature divided by rt. So, if you don't remember what these ifs are, the if I had is the fugacity for species I in solution or in mix mixture. And then 
divided by f i naught. This is the standard. When you see this naught, it's referring to standard. Standard state fugacity for species i. Okay, what are the conditions of standard state? So if we talk about standard state here and standard state here, what are the conditions? Of course, the conditions are three things. The standard state at any given temperature is one bar, pure species, and specified physical state. So when we say Fi standard, we mean the fugacity of a pure I, pure species I, at one bar. And I have to know the physical state. Is it in the solid state? Is it in the liquid state? Is it in the gas state? If it was in the gas state, then I'm referring to the ideal gas state. Okay, so you can see that the temperature is not part of the standard state. So don't be confused. 25 degrees C is not part, it's not the temperature for the standard state. Okay? Nor zero degree is uh, temperature for the standard state. At standard state, the temperature is not specified. Okay, so we use the term fugacity. And what's fugacity? Of course, in chemical thermodynamics, the fugacity, if I, of a real gas is the corrected pressure or the effective pressure, which replaces the actual mechanical pressure in an accurate chemical equilibrium calculations. So, when it comes to safety, if you want to design uh, a lid or a container, a lid of a container or a container itself, which holds a certain gas at certain pressure, you need to know the mechanical pressure to, in order to design a good container with a good thickness that could hold that pressure. However, when you're doing chemical equilibrium calculations, that that mechanical pressure, that actual pressure doesn't help me. I need to use the effective pressure. And this effective pressure is known as fugacity. For example, nitrogen at zero degree C and a pressure of 100 atmosphere has a fugacity of 97 atmosphere. So although this is the mechanical pressure, the force exerted by unit area, but when it comes to chemical reaction calculation, the fugacity, in fact, is only 97 atmosphere. So effectively, it's less than 100 atmosphere. Of course, we can compare the 97 to the 100. We can compare Fi, the fugacity of species I, to the system pressure, to the pressure, actual pressure here. And this is defined as the fugacity coefficient fugacity coefficient. So what's the fugacity coefficient for the nitrogen at the above state? Obviously it is 0.97 with no units. Steam at 300 degrees C and 4000 kilopascal has a fugacity of this much, 3610 kilopascal. And therefore the fugacity coefficient is 0.903. And as you know that steam at such a high pressure, a relatively low temperature, it does not behave. It does not behave ideally. It does not behave ideally. Therefore, its fugacity coefficient is only 0.9. While steam at 300 degrees C and 1 kilopascal, very low pressure, has a fugacity of 1 kilopascal and therefore the fugacity coefficient is 1 therefore the steam is behaving ideally at these conditions okay if effective pressure is called fugacity then what effective concentration is called the effective concentration is represented by a quantity called activity which is given the symbol a in chemical thermodynamics, activity is a measure of the effective concentration of a species in a mixture. That means that the species' chemical potential depends on its activity in a real solution, in the same way that it would depend on its concentration in an ideal solution. So if you have an ideal solution, 
the chemical potential basically depends on concentration. However, and most of the times, I don't have ideal solutions. I have real solution. So I cannot use concentration in my calculations. I have to use the effective concentration, which is known as the activity. Okay, let's take an analogy to simplify this. Okay, so to paint a wall, you would need labors, right? The following is a table that shows the relative the relationship between the number of labors and the time consumed to paint the wall. So, let's see. If I have one labor, it would take him eight hours to paint the wall. Okay. So, that's the effective number of manpower. If I bring two labors instead, they can take half of the time, theoretically, right? And therefore, I have, yes, I do have two people working. However, if I increase the number of people, number of labors to paint the wall, now we start having interaction between these four guys. So you would think it will take them two hours, right? However, in reality, it will take them two and a half hours. That means as if you brought 3.2 people, right? Again, so you look at the number of labors that you have brought. It's four. You would say, oh, four people would finish painting the wall for me in two hours only. However, if you look at the reality, it's taking them two and a half hours. You would say, huh, two and a half. In fact, if I brought only 3.2 labors and they worked effectively, they would finish in 2.5 hours but you guys are four so you're not working as much as four people would work right so if it takes you 2.5 hours that means your effective manpower is only 3.2 if I bring eight people the interaction increases right then they bump into each other they talk to each other they some of them have to wait for the other ones to finish so that you start his work. You expect theoretically they finish in one hour, but it takes them 1.6 hours. And 1.6 hours, in fact, is taken, is the time taken if you have five people working effectively. So effectively, you have five people, you don't have eight people. So I hope with this example, now you know the difference between the effective concentration, the activity, and the concentration, the actual concentration. So in this case here, this is the actual concentration, and this is the activity, sort of. Okay, let's go back to our equation here. And the term, this term, is given the symbol K and it's called the equilibrium constant for the reaction and it's function of temperature only you can see that it's function of temperature only see Shabab? if you are using delta standard delta g reaction so you have fixed the pressure one bar you have fixed all your calculation based on pure species and a given state physical state so the only variable here is temperature the system temperature so k is function of temperature only and therefore, you can now rewrite the above equation as this. And of course, you remember that the this ratio between the fugacities of fugacity of I at the solution uh, divided by the fugacity of I at the standard state, this ratio is known as the activity. It's known as the activity and it's a dimensionless unit. Okay, so now we have our simple equation here where AI is the activity or the effective concentration of a species I and new I is the stoichiometric number according to the reaction as written. Okay. Therefore, if we write this equation this way with this given stoichiometry, then K can be written this way where you have the activities of each species species raised to the power of its stoichiometric coefficient. Okay, that's K.
That's the actual K, the equilibrium constant or the true equilibrium constant. However, people defined other Ks. People defined Kp to be the multiplication of Pi, the partial pressures, as you can see here. Or you can use Kc. You can define Kc. And here you use the concentration of the involved species. Again, they all raise to the stoichiometric number. Okay, so I hope now you understand where, where all these guys are coming from. So the origin of it is the equilibrium constant. And all of these guys is something that we have defined later after defining K and finding its value from this relationship or from its definition. Taib. Taib, let's summarize what we have said so far. Uh, and in fact, in the other, the complete slides, you have all the involved calculations. Now I'm just going to present to you the summary here. For gas phase reactions, for gas phase reactions, K, K in fact equals K phi, where phi is the fugacity coefficient, so it's the ratio of the fugacity coefficient of each the, of the involved species times Kp times the standard pressure to the power negative delta, where delta is the total stoichiometric number. So here we go, the definitions of each of the involved um, symbols here. Okay, for ideal gases, of course, the fugacity coefficients for each species is 1. Therefore, the ratio would remain 1. So you, that's why you don't see it here. So K, relation between K and Kp is given through this equation. Or the relation between K and Kc is given through this relationship. Again, remember, standard pressure is 1 bar. Okay, for liquid phase reactions. For liquid phase reactions, gamma equals, sorry, K equals K gamma times Kc times the total concentration uh, raised to the power minus delta and of course of course for ideal solutions the activity coefficients for the involved species are all one therefore the ratio is one and you will not see it here see it's gone because it's one five now we would like to know the effect of temperature on the equilibrium constant therefore we call upon Van Hoff's equation to help us with this task. As you can see, you have here D link K divided by DT equals standard delta H reaction at the system temperature or the given temperature divided by RT square. Now, let's do some assumptions. If heat capacities Cp can be assumed constant or its average values can be used. Delta H reaction can be written as follows. The standard delta H reaction at any temperature equals the standard delta H reaction at a reference temperature plus delta Cp times T minus Tr where it's the temperature, the reference temperature. Okay. If you substitute for delta standard delta H reaction at T using this equation, you have now this equation which you can integrate. And upon integration, you get this equation which gives you the relationship between K at T2 to K at T1. And of course, in order to find this relationship, you will need the standard delta S reaction at the reference temperature and delta Cp and the two temperatures, T1 and T2. Okay. What if, what if delta H, standard delta H reaction, is assumed independent of temperature? That means it's not function of temperature. That's a really reasonable assumption over small temperature range. So in this case, we say this is constant. We integrate the above equation, and this will 
lead to this equation. Again, we can calculate T, sorry, calculate K at T2, knowing the value of K at T1 and knowing the value of the standard delta H reaction. Pipe. Let's take a special case where you have ideal gas and where you have constant delta H reaction. So if you have the constant delta H reaction, this equation, this form of Van der Hoff equation is valid. And of course, you know that for, so let's look at this ratio and for ideal gas, you know, or for gas in general, or here actually we're talking about ideal gas. Uh, we know that K equals Kp times the pressure, standard pressure, which is power minus delta. And you can tell that these two guys are the same in the numerator and the denominator. So the ratio between the Ks, the equilibrium constant, is the same as the ratio between the pressure equilibrium constant. Therefore, we can rewrite the above equation this way and and when there is no change in the total number of moles yani delta is zero we have k equals kp equals kc and the above equation can be written for kc so that means you find, can find kc at any temperature knowing kc at a reference temperature or at a given temperature and knowing the delta H reaction, the standard delta H reaction. But be careful, the original equation is, gives you the relationship between K, the equilibrium constant, and temperature. Let's take a special case 2, where you have ideal liquid solution with constant delta H reaction and delta H is 0. Again, starting from this relationship, which is derived for constant delta H reaction. You know, for ideal liquid solution, this relationship boils down, of course, this is for liquid, right? This relationship, which is valid for liquid, boils down to K equals Kc times Ct to the power negative delta. But of course, we are saying delta is zero. Therefore, K equals Kc and the above relationship can be written for Kc, and of course, upon manipulation, you can get this relationship. Bye. Let's do a quick test here. Classify these reactions into exothermic and endothermic. So now we are looking at the K versus T. So as temperature increases, the value of K is decreasing. So this is the characteristic of what? Of an exothermic reaction or endothermic reaction? Remember, Shabab, for exothermic reaction, as temperatures increase, the equilibrium is shifted backward towards the reactants. And therefore, when we look at K, the value of the denominator is larger. And therefore, the value of K becomes lower. And therefore, there we go. This is a characteristic for an ex exothermic reaction, while this is the characteristic of endothermic reaction. For an endothermic reaction, if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium shifted forward. Therefore, you have more product compared to the reactant, and therefore the value of K increases. Five. The following conclusions may be drawn from thermodynamics. One, if you have the value of thermodynamic equilibrium constant K, you can calculate the value of the concentration equilibrium constant Kc. Two, K is unaffected by the pressure of the system, by the presence or absence of inerts, or by the kinetics of the reaction but is affected by the temperature of the system. Yani, K is function of temperature only and its value for a given reaction can be found by thermodynamic calculations 
or from thermodynamic charts. Though K is unaffected by pressure or inerts, the equilibrium concentrations, the equilibrium concentrations, not the KC, but the equilibrium concentrations and equilibrium conversion can be affected by these variables. K, when we have K much greater than 1, indicates that practically complete conversion may be possible and that the reaction can be considered to be irreversible. If K is very, very smaller than 1, that indicates reaction will not proceed to any appreciable extent. Six, Kc decreases with increasing temperature for exothermic reactions and increases with increasing temperature for endothermic reactions. The shift in equilibrium is directly function of only two variables, temperature and the involved species concentrations or partial pressures. For an increase in temperature, for an increase in temperature, Xe rises for endothermic reactions and drops for exothermic reactions. For an increase in pressure in gas phase reactions, Xe rises when the number of moles decreases with temperature. For example, we have here 2A goes to B. And if you increase the pressure, the equilibrium conversion increases. That means the equilibrium reaction is shifted forward. However, it's the opposite if you have the stoichiometry A goes to 2B. For an increase in inert dilution with variable volume or volumetric flow rate. So again, we're talking about increasing and inert but this is we're talking about this only in these cases because otherwise if you had constant volume or volumetric flow rate then you will end up with the fact that the concentration is not changing okay so for an increase in inert for all reactions xe drops when the number of moles decreases with the reaction. So we have here 2A goes to B. If we increase the amount of inert, then the reaction would like to counteract this effect. So when you increase the concentration of inert or the amount of inert, the concentration of all the species decreases, right? So, it, so the reaction would, wants to counter effect this. So in order to increase the concentration of the involved species, the reaction, the equilibrium is shifted backward. The equilibrium shifted backward, leading to smaller Xe. And the opposite is true for this reaction. A goes to 2B. Okay, finally, I would like to invite you to my cafe, which is known as La Chateleur du Café. That's how I named it where you can enjoy the equilibrium atmosphere where and where thermodynamically stable guys hang out. Please note that lunatics and kinetics are not allowed. And this is the menu of my cafe. Le Chateleur du Café. With this, we reached the end of our thermodynamic review. Please review and solve the examples in the slides. Thank you very much and see you soon.